Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for attending this presentation. Due to my teaching tasks, I'm not able to be here in person right now, and I hope to join the session later. I sincerely apologize for this. On the other hand, uh, see how amazing our times are that I can be in two places at the same time. My talk today is part of my project, Mapping Rabbinic Emotions. So let me share my screen now. Mm -mm -mm. I hope you can all see that. As rabbinic culture does not have a word for the concept of emotions, I will look into a few words that are candidates for referring to what we cluster as emotions. So let me first start by saying something shortly about emotions and embodiment, then explain my mapping of rabbinic emotions, and lastly, look into a few concepts that may fall into what we cluster as emotions. The last of which is Yetzer, which I will contextualize in the framework of emotions. For Yetzer, I'm relying on Rosen Svi's work, which studied the Yetzer for itself, not in the context of emotions. Recent scientific literature about emotions asserts that the relationship between bodily reactions and emotions is not an habitual juxtaposition. There is no universal correlation between a bodily phenomenon and an emotion. Tears can be of happiness or sadness, sweat can result from fear or other excitements, and this holds true also for facial expressions, even though earlier we were led to think that they were universal. Rather, a range of physical phenomena testify to bodily arousal, dilation of the pupils, salivation, increased respiration and heart rate, or secretion of hormones. What makes this unique to emotions is that this arousal is brought to the consciousness, to our awareness, as usually we are not aware of such physiological changes in our body. This awareness enables people to assign a word to the combination of a situation and an arousal. Love to the combination of an increased heart rate and the sight of the loved one. Compassion when feeling or tearing upon encountering a suffering other, etc. These combinations are culturally unique. To illustrate, it comes down to the question what the girl on the left says to herself. Is it, I'm not reading, and then she's not emotional? Or is it, I'm deprived of a book, and then she's assessing her personal situation and she finds herself deprived. This in turn can move her to act, that is, to acquire a book. How to conceptualize this in a way relevant for rabbinic culture? I have constructed this schematic representation for this purpose. Here is a schematic representation of the elements that make up emotions. I will use the term semiosis for meaning making. Action with semiosis is not emotional as no bodily arousal is involved, culturally speaking, not biologically. Our modern conceptualization of emotion, which is based on the Greek one, sees an arousal with semiosis without there being necessarily an action. We talk about being in the emotion. We pause and sense it and then decide to act or not, at least this is how we perceive ourselves as doing. In rabbinic culture, we find a lot of the arousal action line, but they are only interested in it when the action has religious significance regarding halakha or morality. This mapping categorizes rabbinic emotions, taking into consideration the embodiment and the semiosis. Until I come up with better concepts, I will call these categories A, B, and C. Let us now look into some roots that might denote emotions. The root lahat, originally having to do with heat, describes wanting to do something intensively or on a regular basis. There is no indication of semiosis on the part of the doer. Therefore, it is only problematic if the action itself is problematic. I will use the verb obsess to translate this root. Such action is attributed to animals. A snake is obsessed with garlic in a story from Genesis Rabbah, which you have as source number one in your handout. I will not read it all here. 
A fly is obsessed with a strike in Psikta de Rav Kahana, in source number two, and a dog is obsessed with carcasses in source number three, again from Genesis Rabbah. The fact that animals are said to have this drive entails a lack of semiosis, as animals do not attribute symbolic meaning to eating the garlic or the carcasses, also in rabbinic understanding. This root is also used for people. Source number four, a parable from Leviticus Rabbah, tells about a king's son who became accustomed to eating non-kosher meat. The nimshan of the parable is the Israelites who were obsessed lehutim with sacrificing to idols in Egypt. Therefore, God established sacrifices for himself in the desert, and this would keep the Israelites from sacrificing to idols. So the Israelites will continue with their obsession, only with a new target. Thus, the obsession itself was not the problem, only the target of the action. When redirecting the action, the problem is solved. The change of semiosis is the solution. In the Palestinian Talmud, we read about the cultivation of an obsession. Forty years prior to the exile to Babylonia, date trees were planted there, so that the Israelites arriving there would be obsessed with sweet things, because this habituates the tongue for the Torah. Admittedly, the wording is not very clear, but regardless of what the implied process is, the obsession is purposely cultivated, as it is parallel to the recitation, if not to the study of the Torah, an important rabbinic value. These cases refer to a customary conduct which is driving an animal or a person. There's no semiosis, neither for the animal nor for the humans, no kavana. So a problem only arises when the action itself is culturally problematic. The solution then is not punishment or prohibition, probably because punishment is useless for animals and people that behave like them, but the solution is redirecting the semiosis. So this root, Lahat, is in the B area on the mapping of rabbinic emotions, far from the peak of semiosis. What we see with the verb hamad, crave or covet, is a sequence of an emotion and an action. This means that there is a gap between the two. Like the category A, an emotion as a state of being and the action as a separate from it in the map above. Is there semiosis here? Source number six from Sifrei on Deuteronomy tell the story about Rabbi Elazar ben Shamoa and Rabbi Yochanan the shoemaker, to Tanaim, who went to Nisbis, outside the land of Israel, to study Torah. Arriving at Sidon, north of the Kinneret, they looked back at the land and started crying because they were leaving their beloved country. They then argue that inhabiting the land is more important than all other commandments and returned to stay in the land. Three things make the story different from the earlier ones. First, as I said, the gap between the sensation and the action. Second, the sensation is now endowed with meaning. Upon feeling the sorrow, the rabbis argue for staying in the land, thus making meaning of it. And thirdly, the embodiment is here described in a stylized literary manner, crying. The same attitude that we find in this story from Halachic Midrash, we also find in the Mechilta de Rashbi in an Halachic explanation. This is source number seven. Here we read, how do we know that if a person envisions, my translation of Iva, he will end up coveting Hamad, as it says, and here the text quotes a reworking of a verse from Deuteronomy. And how do we know the text continues that if a person covets Hamad, he will end up seizing Gazal. And here they quote a verse from Micah. The Midrash Halacha presents a sequence of inner activity, Iva, envisioning, which leads to a drive, Hamad, coveting, which in turn leads to an action, Gazal, a wrong action. In the mapping of the emotional process, this would cover areas A and B and also point to a gap between not only the drive and the act, but also between the mental state, envisioning, Iva, the drive, Kovet, Hamad, 
and the action sees Ghazal. This sequence is a place where a person is held responsible for his own actions, including the mental ones. So unlike the drive we saw with regard to the root lahat, when the transgressor can be recorrected by redirecting, Hamad entails semiosis and thus renders the transgressor accountable for their drives and actions. It is they who have to correct themselves. Among the reproach speeches in the book of Jeremiah, one finds the story of the Rechabites. They serve as an example of piousness as they adhere to their father's command not to drink wine, even when brought to the temple and being offered with wine to drink. In rabbinic halachic literature, the Rechabites are in the list of priestly families that serve in the temple. And in Aganic literature, they are proclaimed the offspring of Jethro and therefore converts that joined the Israelites voluntarily. They are still an epitome of piousness. Their piousness is proclaimed in Sifrei Zuta on Numbers, together with Jethro. If someone who had been from the nations of the land because he did out of love, God gave him out of love, referring to God's promise to keep the Rechabites in his service all the days, how much more so if they had been from Israel. So the Rechabites, the converts, are praised for their doing out of love, but it would have been better had it been the Israelites who did this. Our issue here is, of course, the doing out of love. We see here a separation between the act and the state of mind, the emotion, love. The halachic Tanaitic sources distinguish between acting out of love and acting out of fear, a distinction which is a sore point of theological disagreement regarding Job's in incentive to act, where Rabban Yohanan ben Zakkai argues for fear and his student Rabbi Yoshua argues for love. The debate itself points again, as did the quote above, to an ambiguity regarding doing out of love. The ambiguity regarding this positive route is interesting. It continues the use of this route in the narrative biblical text, where it refers to a spontaneous action that diverts from the socially proper or expected conduct. In rabbinic culture, I ascribe this ambiguity to the image of the halachic person the rabbis had in mind for the society they worked to establish and keep. Relying on emotionality, love, as the incentive for acting, even halachic acting, is not safe. A society of people in love is not sustainable. The rabbis, therefore, while tolerating positive, intensive attitude toward halachic conduct, did not demand it as a default state of mind. In terms of the map I drew earlier, we find here an unexpected, I think, combination between one of the most highly valued semions of rabbinic culture, halachic conduct, and a high arousal a positive one, love. This correlation is only tolerated and is not promoted, as I think we would have expected. Doing out of love is pushed away from the map. The Tanaitic expression, doing out of love, is found in sources of the Akivian school only, the one to become later the dominant in rabbinic culture and in none of the Ishmaelites ones. This takes us nicely into considering the place of Yetzer in this scheme, in this map. So how does the Yetzer fall into this map? Is the Yetzer an emotion? There is much to expand on this and I will only sketch some points here. As I said, I'm relying heavily on Rosensvi's work with regard to the Yetzer. There is parallels in the attitude of the two Tanaitic school to Yetzer and to emotions. We saw this regarding doing out of love. The one of Rabbi Ishmael avoids both altogether and the Rabbi Akiva accepts both with due restrictions. 
as these could be directed to the good or bad. A second point of parallelism, Yetzer is highly semiotic. It is not a drive per se, but a drive to do something very good or very bad. This puts Yetzer in a similar domain to emotions as we think of them as and as we found with regard to uh, Hamad. However, as Rosensvi has shown, while inside a person, the Yetzer is not one and the same with the person. It is an external entity, a highly personified one in Amoraic literature. This creature leads people in a way different from what they have initially wanted. As an external being, where in the anatomy of a person does the Yetzer reside? As Kipiewasser points out in his article about the heart, the Yetzer is found outside the opening of the heart. The Yetzer thus functions as a layer between the emotion, the semiotic arousal, and the action. So this is the mapping of the Yetzer between the emotion and the action. The rabbinic effort is to encourage a halachic person who is highly semiotic but not overdriven. They do acknowledge the role of arousal in the creation of engagement, including semiotic engagement, but they do not encourage access of arousal. This does not necessarily entail that they are asking to restrain the emotions, as here comes the yetzer into play. The rabbis are asking not to give in to this external creature whenever it has a bad influence. I end here. Thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you later on.